Since the dawn of the 21st century, scientific discovery has rushed forward at lightning speed. Genetics, physics, computerized technology, robotics, virtual reality. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert as they uncover the truths behind this ultimate scientific deception. Welcome to Sci Friday. It's just a piece of cloth until you apply. Ah! Welcome to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. I don't know that applying science to it, I think applying miracle to it. Yes, and science is confirming that the uh, skeptics, of course, we're talking about the Shroud of Turin, the skeptics criticisms don't hold up when you apply scientific rigor. That is so... You know what? The Lord promised that in the last days, knowledge would increase. Not only is archaeology confirming the, the details of the Bible, the historicity of the Bible, but it's also confirming... Uh, science is also confirming the miracle of the resurrection. Yes. It is... Um, I think the, the way to look at it is, is this. It, the, the shroud cannot confirm that that it was the shroud of Jesus and that it was resurrected. But when you start e e eliminating the... Uh, the other possibilities. The, the other possibilities. And in fact, one of our guests this week, and we're bringing back some interviews that I recorded at the Prophecy Watchers conferences almost nine years ago. You about looked a the little shroud. different back then. I, I did. I had more brown in here. than. Is this is a video a, or audio? This is audio only. Uh, <laughs> so you won't get to see Derek, but we've got pictures from back then. So yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll hide those. So, uh, <clears throat> <laughs> but the, the scientific approach to this can exclude the other explanations. And so what you're left with is evidence that circumstantially supports the narrative of the Bible, does not contradict the narrative of the Bible. That's very important, especially since one of our guests is Jewish. Uh, yes, and uh, that was re led to an interesting question. Um, the, uh, if, if you reach the conclusion that the shroud is genuine, it's legitimate, and you, you maintain your Jewishness, and, and he's not a Messianic Jew, uh, I asked at least him about he wasn't that. At the he time. wasn't at the time. Now, again, this, these interviews were recorded in 2013, so I don't know how his uh, view of uh, the, Jesus Christ has changed since then. But th there are some advantages to that as well, for him to speak on behalf of the Shroud as a non-Christian. Mm -hmm. That eliminates an objection that skeptics would have, just saying, oh, you're just trying to confirm your bias. It's like, well, he really doesn't have a dog in the hunt. Um, so God selected this gentleman for a very special role. We'll talk more about him after the break. But uh, our first guest, who we had the opportunity to meet and uh, talk with personally a couple of times back in 2013 and 2014, mm -hmm. has been researching and uh, lecturing about the Shroud of Turin for 30 years. And uh, when he breaks it down and explains the evidence and details that it's like a crime scene investigation. It truly is. But he is the, uh, the man behind the Shroud encounter. He travels around the country, travels around the world, speaking and lecturing on it. And uh, back in the uh, fall of 2013, had the opportunity to speak to Russ Brialt. Well, you have a 14-foot-long linen cloth. It bears the faint image of a bearded, crucified man, front and back image of a man who appears to be about 5 foot 10. It bears all of the markings of the crucifixion as recorded in the gospel, a crown of thorns, a wound a scourging all over the back, um, wound in the side, nail wounds in the wrist, nail wounds in the feet. Um, it's the most analyzed artifact in the world. It's been subjected to thousands of hours of scientific analysis. And the, um, the either or proposition with the shroud is, could this be the authentic burial shroud of Jesus, or is it nothing more than some kind of a medieval hoax? Now, if it's, if it's ostensibly the work of an artist, then there must be some kind of substances on the cloth to account for the image as well as the blood stain. So is there any kind of paint, ink, dye, pigmentation, stain? What's on the cloth? Is the blood blood or is it animal blood? Is it paint? Is it human blood? Is it blood from wounds? Well, uh, again, in 1978, a team of, uh, team of scientists, uh, 24 scientists, 40 members of the entire team, went over and had five 
five days with the cloth, 122 hours uh, access with it, brought over all kinds of gear, uh, uh, spectroscopy and x-radiography, infrared thermography, and photomicroscopy. And, um, and their conclusion was, it's not the work of an artist. Hmm. There, are no, there, there is no visible trace of any artistic substance on the cloth to account for the image. And the blood is blood. Uh, uh, AB, AB blood type in 1995, we determined that it had human male DNA. Um, and it's blood from actual wounds. It's not just painted blood. It's blood from what we see on the cloth is the exudate of wounds from a man who died upright in a position of crucifixion. And so the medical forensics, uh, the forensic pathologists have weighed in, the blood chemists, the image specialists, and saying, looks like it could be authentic. And, uh, of course, that's my position on the Shroud, is that um, I'm not going to make any pronouncements that this is, in fact, the Burl Shroud of Jesus, because you can't make that statement scientifically. Because at the end of the day, we don't have the DNA of Jesus to match it up with something we might extract from the Shroud. Right. But you can eliminate all the alternatives, and you really only come, up, you come away with one conclusion it's probably authentic and um, now what's the chain of evidence to to borrow a phrase from csi uh what, what's the chain of evidence i mean you mentioned the word medieval uh, mm -hmm. medieval hoax which is one of the charges leveled by skeptics right where was the shroud discovered or when did it come to light and what do we know about its history prior to the middle ages well it first appears it has a fully documented history in western europe beginning around 1353 mm -hmm. and when it when it shows up in um in Lorraine, france and um and so the now this now there are some that would say well it's the work of leonardo da vinci well that's nonsense because leonardo wasn't born for a hundred years later like around around 1450. Um, so the uh, but then there's a, but then we also know that the cloth was in Constantinople for several hundred years and was stolen during the Fourth Crusade in 1204, and it kind of goes into hiding for about 150 years and then reappears in Lorraine, France, in 1353. Now this cloth that was in Constantinople that was stolen in 1204 that has a documented history all the way back to the sixth century. And, um, and prior to the 6th century, now you're getting into legends and folklore, and, you know, the, the history can get a little sketchy. But you actually have, what's interesting is you have the legend of King Abgar, who, who was the, who was the, he is the, this is written up in the, on the historical writings of Asubius, who was the official church historian for the Emperor Constantine. Uh, so this is written, you know, circa 4th century, and it talks about, about Abgar being the being the king of the city state of Edessa, uh, 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 which is about today would be in southern Turkey. Then it was its own separate city state, and uh, um, about two hundred miles from Jerusalem. And the story goes is that Abgar was dying of leprosy, and so he sends a messenger down to Jerusalem to find Jesus and request that he come to Edessa to bring healing to him. Mm. Well, obviously Jesus had other plans, right? Mm -hmm. So the story goes is that this messenger then returned to Edessa with a cloth with a mysterious image on it and Abgar beholds the image and he's healed of leprosy. Well along with the messenger comes Jude Thaddeus one of the twelve apostles wrote the book of Jude and, and, and he evangelizes the city as well hmm. and, so, and, and so legend and folklore goes all the way back to first century where a cloth with an image on it a mysterious image arrives in Edessa for, uh, circa first century Century. And um, and it's there until 944, taken to Constantinople, disappears in 1204, reappears 1353. This is the probable history, and it's uh, interesting that the that the historical trail is corroborated with the with the uh, with the pollen trail, is that mm -hmm. is that many pollens have have, you, have been removed from the shroud. In fact, uh, Avinoam Danin, he's the leading botanist in 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 Israel. He's written seven books on the flora of Palestine based on the based on the based on the pollen as well as the flower images that appear to be on the cloth he'll tell you that he believes that 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 the shroud originated in a 20 um, kilometer radius of Jerusalem 
that's pretty specific. Mm-hmm. And man, he's not Christian. He was he's and and he's written seven books on the on the flowers of Palestine. His last book is called The Botany of the Shroud. Huh. <laughs> What's really fascinating is that uh, when they look at the pollen that was captured by the shroud and botanists, again, a Jewish botanist, not a Christian botanist, Mm -hmm. concluded that it could only have originated within a 20 kilometer radius of Jerusalem and probably in the first century. Oh, I know. And uh, there has been the argument in the past, the radiocarbon dating of the material itself said that it was not old enough to have been a 2000 year old uh, item. However, yes. uh, there are two arguments against that conclusion. One is that radiocarbon dating is very inaccurate, but the other one is that it, the portion of the uh, the shroud that was used for that probably was the patch, which was medieval. Right, because it was damaged in the Middle third Ages. Third item, right. I'll come in again, third item, is that a brand new laser uh, uh, scan of the material indicates it is 2,000 years old. Yeah, this is a new technique called wide-angle X-ray scattering. And a, uh, this was done by Italy's Institute of Crystallography of the National Research Council, Liberato Di Caro. Mm-hmm. What a great name. I know it. Found that based on this new technique that the shroud could be around 2,000 years old. Now, again, as Russ said during the interview, it, uh, th- we've got a good chain of evidence from about the 14th century onward but there is evidence that it was stolen by crusaders from Constantinople around 1206 in the 13th century. And when you take that back, you've got a pretty good chain of it uh, being in Constantinople, assuming it's the same piece of cloth, back to the 6th century. And then the story of uh, the, the king of Edessa, which is modern San Liurfa, uh, very possibly ancient Ur in southern Turkey. We're going we visit, there yes. this year. And we'll tell you about that in just a few minutes. The king of Edessa named Abgar was uh, suffering from leprosy, and this was in the, the first century, and um, sent to Jerusalem to find th- this Jesus who could come and heal him. Now, of course, Jesus had already gone to the cross and been mm-hmm. resurrected, but there, the sto- as the story goes, and there's no way to confirm this, that uh, Jude, Jude Thaddeus, came to Edessa with this miraculous piece of cloth and Abgar was miraculously healed. Now, Mm. whether that's true or not, we don't know, but at least there are legends of a piece of cloth purporting to be the burial shroud of Jesus going back to the very first century AD. And it appears, based on the modern research, that um, the Shroud of Turin is uh, that old and could only have originated within 20 kilometers based on the pollen and grain unique to that region of uh, Jerusalem. Well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to have another guest, and uh, we'll continue with the discussion of the Shroud yes. of Turin. More Sci Friday after this. This program is an outreach of Gilbert House Ministries, one of the ways we share the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Each week, we produce Unraveling Revelation, a study of Bible prophecy from Genesis to Revelation, Sci Friday, a look at science news through a biblical lens. Our weekly study of the Bible, the Gilbert House Fellowship, as we go through the Bible verse by verse in chronological order, and my podcast, A View from the Bunker, and we rely on your support. There are two ways you can join us in this mission. First and foremost, your prayers. We truly and deeply appreciate your prayerful support. And if you are led to help us financially, you can do that two ways. First, you can donate through a link at our website, gilberthouse.org. Second, you can visit our online shop, a sort of virtual book table, where you'll find our books and DVDs. Just click the link at gilberthouse.org or scan the QR code on your screen. And during the month of May, save 20% on all DVDs with the promo code MAY20. That's MAY20. Again, thank you for your prayers and thank you for your support. Welcome back to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. I hope you got your tea or your coffee, or unless, of course, you're in bed. If you're, uh, we hear a lot of people say that they watch Sci Friday in bed at night as they're getting ready to go to sleep because our voices are so soothing. <laughs> so go to sleep. Don't have coffee in your bed if you're trying to sleep. Uh, we are going to go to Turkey, as we mentioned earlier, in October of 2022 this year. And uh, we would love for you to go with us. Just go to skywatchinturkey.com or Point your phone at that QR code yes. that Derek is going to so kindly put up on the screen when he edits this together. 
<laughs> well, uh, and why, why Turkey, you may ask? It's because so much of the Bible's history, but also prophetic importance is so wrapped up in much, Turkey. The so much. seven churches of Revelation all located there. Abraham was called from there. And uh, there will be other things that we'll discuss. And archaeologically speaking, getting a chance to visit Gobekli Tepe, which is the world's oldest religious community, oldest religious settlement ever, founded by hunter-gatherers, not as a place where they could farm or to defend themselves against enemies, specifically as a place of worship, probably under the influence of the angels who visited humanity in the pre-flood world. Exactly. It's a fascinating place. It's been on my bucket list for a long time, so I'm looking forward to going there. And I know Tom Horn can't wait to see our footage when we get back. Yes. Well... Skywatchinturkey.com, skywatchinturkey.com. That's the uh, URL, oh, but again, QR code. QR code, yes, indeed. I uh, also want to remind you that uh, the month of May is nearly over, so your chance to get 20% off all the DVDs at our online store is about to go away. Yeah, so take advantage of that. Uh, promo code May20, May20, gets you 20% off any DVD at our store, gilberthouse.org slash store, or uh, once again, QR code on your screen. QR code. And one last thing before we go back to the Shroud is that is we want you to go to Israel with us in March. Skywatchinisrael.com or the QR code. <laughs> oh, we love the QR codes. Yeah. It will help you to get all the information. We'd love for you to sign up. Um, the Shroud of Turin. Yes. More and more stories are coming out about that. I wonder why the... the uh, the Lord is making that story come back again now. It is, yeah, that's that's interesting that this is coming back again. Um, when we first heard about it, yeah, I, when, when I first heard about it, I thought this is too spectacular to possibly be true. And I know that there are many of you who feel that way as mm -hmm. well. Um, or there are others who will object to it and say, well, this is just trying to promote an icon. And we as Protestant Christians do not venerate icons. That's not what this is about. No, not at all. We're not worshiping it. We're saying this is a bit of evidence. And on our program, Unraveling Revelation, we interviewed our good friend David W. Lowe about his book called Earthquake Resurrection. And surprisingly, he included a section on the Shroud in that book because he argues that the, uh, the earthquake in Matthew 27 was caused by the resurrection of a number of saints. We know at the time of Jesus' death there was an earthquake, and that's been proven, uh, confirmed by uh, seismographers working west of the Dead Sea. They date it to exactly that period of history, 30 AD, give or take a few years. He argues that the energy release caused by that resurrection, which imprinted the image of Jesus on that mm -hmm. cloth, is what uh, led to the, the many saints walking around who were seen by many in the city, according to Matthew chapter 27. Well, we talked with... Uh, a, a gentleman who was a professional photographer who worked at uh, uh, worked on government projects, uh, capturing images related to things that he said I could tell you about, but then I'd have to kill you. Uh. Uh, but then he was invited to join the um, the Shroud Project, and as an Orthodox Jew, he was raised Orthodox Jew, but then became an atheist. Oh, so interesting. He didn't, he didn't but now he's gone back to... He's gone back to... He's re-examined his relationship with God, and he is, uh, at least as of this recording in 2013, or our recording of the interview back in 2013 at the Prophecy Watchers Conference, was an Orthodox Jew. But he said, based on what he saw, it absolutely convicted him that this is legitimate. He's got a website where he still, still shares the evidence for the authenticity of the Shroud. Shroud.com is the website, and... Uh, Going back in time, almost nine years, here's our interview with Barry Schwartz. I uh, had operated a photographic studio that specialized in scientific, medical, technical, and commercial photography. Uh, not portraits and weddings, but um, working a lot in the corporate scientific area, a lot of aerospace clients. And so I had a good, strong technical background as a graduate of Brooks Institute of Photography and then being on the faculty there years later. Um, so I was approached by a gentleman who... Uh, worked with a company that was a contractor to Los Alamos National Laboratories. Mm. And they were looking for somebody who was a photographic consultant to, to work with them. They needed to get images off of green screen raster display monitors, which, you know, now all we have to do is hit the print screen button and we're done. In those days, you had to set up a camera, block all the light, cut the reflections, and know the right exposure to get what, capture what was on these green screen displays, much like an oscilloscope display. So we did a seven-month project for Los Alamos. Obviously, it had to do with atomic bombs. And I could tell you more, but then I'd have to kill you, so yes, we'll yes. leave it at that. And <laughs> uh, we, did, uh, we did this project for seven months, and when we finished the project, um, 
I went back to my normal routine, and the gentleman who I'd worked with, an imaging scientist, called me up a few weeks later, and he said, Barry, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? So I laughed, and I said, but Don, I'm Jewish. And he laughed, and he said, so am I, remember? He was one of the other Jewish guys that wound up on our team. And so he explained to me that they had learned some new information about the shroud. They'd uh, run it through a, a device called a VP8 image analyzer, which was able to visualize the spatial information that's encoded into the shroud's image, mm -hmm. depth or mm -hmm. topographical information encoded directly into the density of the image. And you can't do that with normal photography, and you can't, certainly can't do that in an artwork. So that facet of the shroud's image, that physical property of the shroud's image, caught my interest. But I was very apprehensive about getting involved with something that I felt had really little to do with me. Um, and so I said no <laughs> at first. And uh, he said, let me bring you some information and uh, can look at it and consider it. And he, what he brought me was a pile about this high of religious tracts. That didn't help a bit. <laughs> so <laughs> there I was sort of caught in between, fascinated by the image. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll go ahead and get on this team. A few months goes by, and I'm really feeling uncomfortable about it. I, uh, I didn't really have a comfort zone with it. I felt, eh, I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish home. So for me, uh, this was about something that really had little, I felt at that mm -hmm. time, to do with me. Um, a few months into the project, a couple of new guys joined the team, imaging guys, from the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California, hmm. uh, from NASA. And one of the two gentlemen, Don Lynn, may he rest in peace, uh, was the head of imaging on Voyager, Viking, Mariner, Galileo. You might have heard of some of those. Mm -hmm. And Don Lynn was a good Catholic man, and I remember saying to him one day, gee, Don, what's a nice Jewish boy like me doing on this team? And he looked at me and said, well, apparently you've forgotten that the man in question's a Jew. And I said, no, that's about the only thing I knew about Jesus, yeah. that he was Jewish. But I said, no, I, that, that wasn't what my problem was. And he said, so you don't think God wants one of his chosen people on our team? And, and then I laughed. I said, no, I never thought that. And then Don gave me what perhaps, in retrospect, may have been the best advice I've ever been given. He said, Barry, go to Turin. Do the best job you can do. God doesn't tell us in advance what the plan is, but one day you'll know. And on those words, I stayed on that team. Hmm. And the beauty of it is, of course, that's 35 years ago. The course of my life was dramatically altered by my involvement with the Shroud. Um, although, uh, much to the chagrin of many of the people attending this conference, uh, when I say I'm a Jew, I'm not a Messianic Jew, which is a real shock to people. Mm -hmm. But um, I have to be honest, the point, my involvement with this came from science, from my uh, technological experience and background. And yet, after examining the shroud, it took another 17 years until 1995 for the evidence, the scientific evidence, which I helped to gather, collect, and, and re reduce and evaluate, uh, for that evidence to ultimately leave me with no alternative but to accept the shroud as authentic. And I often quote Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Sherlock Holmes, if, uh, if, you remove, if you eliminate all the possibilities, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, is most likely the truth. Mm -hmm. And by applying that axiom and studying it for a long time, almost 20 years, in 1995, the last piece of evidence came in and I, I had no alternative but to accept the shroud was authentic. There's no other possible explanation. Having been in such close contact with the evidence for the Shroud of Turin and, and seeing the way the, the Shroud... Uh, closely fits the the accounts of the Gospels, mm -hmm. um, which, to my mind, would would attest to the the truth claims of, of the Gospels, yeah. and, and Jesus claim that uh, uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. Mm -hmm. um, Why am you, I still you, Jew? You, you, st you still call yourself a Jew, <laughs> right? And that that's the question. Yeah, I know. No, it's and actually it's a very common question, and because I take a public role in talking about the Shroud. There is no such thing as an off-limits question. If I got to a point where I would go, oh, that's too personal, then I should stop doing this. Because I'm, I'm addressing people's faith, even though that's not really what I'm addressing. I'm addressing an object to which may right. be important to their faith. And which people will then need to consider as they Absolutely. determine what they believe, just as... So, yeah. from my point of view, and I kind of intimated this earlier, that, uh, you know, I see myself as one who was given a great privilege to have been in this room not for myself, and that my role doesn't really matter what my beliefs are, 
what matters is somebody can speak honestly to what we know about the Shroud. I certainly can't be accused of, accused of having a Christian bias, which is what skeptics are always looking for. Sure, Some, sure. some of the most uh, po- vocal skeptics on the Shroud don't want to debate with me anymore because I know the science really well, so they can't compete with me there. And they can't accuse me of having a Christian bias because yeah. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Messianic Jew. And each person has to decide for himself. Look, that piece of cloth didn't come with a book of instructions. And no one's faith should rely simply on a piece of cloth. Yeah. Okay? So no book of instructions, no piece of cloth. Where's the answer to faith? In the eye and the heart of those who look upon it. This, he makes no bones about it. He says, absolutely, it's authentic. And I think, again, the way he summarized it is absolutely right on. Science cannot tell us for sure, the scientific method cannot tell us for sure that this is the burial cloth of Jesus because we cannot go into the laboratory now and replicate the experiment. We cannot raise somebody from the dead to see what happens when they're resurrected. We cannot, but the fact that we have this, it, to me, if you are on the fence about believing in a supernatural world, a miraculous event called the, called the resurrection, then this is something that may be what convinces you. Mm-hmm. I believe, if it's true, and I personally do believe that the shroud is what covered our Lord and Savior, um, I believe we have it today, that it survived and it was in a fire. Mm-hmm, there mm-hmm. are a number of times it's been stolen right. and, and uh, set, set alight that uh, it's still here today because the Lord is trying to give evidence to those stubborn individuals like Thomas, show me. Yeah, yeah. So this is something that may convince those skeptics. And I know, again, that because I've had email exchanges as we've discussed this uh, over the past few weeks with, with people who, who are, are biased against it because of who owns the shroud, the Roman Catholic Church, and it, the chain of evidence. But the fact remains, this could not have been created by an artist. Certainly not with the tactics or techniques available to artists in the 14th century. No, not at all. This could not have originated anywhere other than the vicinity of Jerusalem. And I, I love this. This is not in the interview, but Barry said his, his Jewish mother heard him speak on this for the very first time and said, well, of course it's authentic. It was the burial shroud. Why, if this was the burial shroud of an ordinary man, they would have thrown it away years ago. But it has to belong to Jesus. Like He said, you know, brilliant, with a mother's logic. Thanks, Some Mom. will accept it on that basis alone. Others need to see the science, and the science is there if you're willing to look. Um, I'll put links in the notes below this video, wherever you're watching it, uh, both for Russ Briel's website and uh, Barry Schwartz's website. Uh, take it uh, as what it is. Science not contradicting the word of God, but actually supporting the narrative that we serve the only one who was resurrected from the dead and through whom alone we have access to the only one the who Father. resurrected himself. Yes, exactly right. And uh, again, the story supported by science. Thank you for watching. This is Sci Friday. Sci Friday is a viewer supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at SciFriday.tv and GilbertHouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. Join us each week as we go through the Bible verse by verse in chronological order. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri 65633.